Hi, I'm Stephen Perrier. Today I'm going to take about 10 minutes to talk about two very closely related topics, measurement uncertainty and calibration tolerances. What do they have to do with each other and which came first? Most people have encountered calibration tolerances, so I'm going to focus on them. But what I'm going to say can apply not only to a tolerances, but to any quantitative requirement about how a piece of measuring equipment is going to act. Lately, I, I've noticed that I keep running into people who are confused by these two things and who also get them mixed up. My goal is to clarify this a little bit for anybody who's searching around on the web for help. I have 10 years experience doing field calibrations and instrumentation work. I also have another 10 years working with downstream customers of the calibration process. So let's look into this question. How does the uncertainty that rides along with every, every measurement we make with our equipment have anything to do with us when all we're trying to do is understand equipment specifications or performance? Here's one source of confusion. At first, measurement uncertainty theory and, and calibration tolerances didn't even coexist. A fundamental component of measurement uncertainty is the normal distribution. One of the first people to publish about this distribution was Carl Gauss in 1809. But as it happened, he found it useful for a completely different problem than the one we're going to be talking about today. However, during the rest of the 19th century, more and more people discovered the usefulness and power of the normal distribution. Almost all of these people were mathematicians, statisticians, or astronomers. It took until the end of the 19th century before people began to get comfortable with the idea that the normal distribution could actually describe the way things were in the real world. As for calibration tolerances, even at the beginning of the 20th century, calibrations and their tolerances barely existed in the form we'd recognize today. Now, uncertainty theory was relatively more advanced. That's because its base was being strengthened steadily by people who didn't have to wait for a bunch of calibrations to be made in a factory to give them data to work with. However, there had been no organized effort to tackle the problem of applying uncertainty theory to the outcome of a measurement in an industrial setting, nor had anyone succeeded in quantifying the uncertainty of that particular kind of measurement process. During this era, most calibrations in any work setting were performed by a production line foreman just to make sure that things weren't getting too wild down on the shop floor. But things were continuing to change just as they always do. In this same period, the National Bureau of Standards was formed in 1903. It survives to this day as the National Institute of Science and Technology and continues to provide crucial guidance in this area. And then, as so often is the case, a war came along. In this case, it was World War II. And as usual, it pushed the survivors forward much faster than they would have gone otherwise. Until World War II, the practice of calibration was still pretty primitive, but met the needs of the time. The immediate post-war period saw the birth of the 4 to 1 rule for maintaining the validity of calibrations of measuring equipment. Basically, this rule of thumb means that the tolerance of the standard is expected to be four times better than the equipment upon which it is used. This is usually all that's necessary to protect the integrity of the measurement process. Here's the way it works. If you want to assure yourself that a, te a temperature gauge you've got is accurate to 4 degrees centigrade, anywhere in its range, then you need to calibrate or compare it with a gauge that's, uh, that we'll call a standard that's good to 1 degree centigrade if you want to supply that assurance. So let me illustrate this. Let's pretend we've done um, a thousand calibrations of this gauge with the calibration standard that we just dreamed up, and let's see how they graph. I've asked Excel to create 1,000 normally distributed measurements. We can pretend that these are the results of applying our 4 to 1 standard to our gauge 1,000 times. We have also set some upper and lower limits to the, to the data to show that what we're willing to accept from this gauge is performance. There's the two tolerance lines. Now remember, these are measurements, and measurements are always normally, normally distributed. They're not randomly distributed, so don't get these two dis distributions mixed up. We can tell we're normally distributed because most of the measurement results are near the middle, and we see fewer and fewer data points the further out from the average we look. Now let's look at the problems that are lurking in this data set and just waiting for us. For example, 
Is this point up here really out of tolerance, or was the standard just a little wide of the mark? Or perhaps the calibration technician uh, misrecorded the data. Um, here's another point. This point is an equal distance inside the line. Um, using the same suspicions, we might say, well, possibly it's outside of the tolerance line. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that probability is always present when we take data. And it's always in the background and it keeps rearing its head if we pay, only, pay attention only to tolerances. So, after the Second World War, we found ourselves in a peculiar state. We had the analytical tools from statistics theory to help us answer the kinds of questions we're talking about. But the focus wasn't there to apply these tools to this narrow case of measurement uncertainty in a business or industrial environment. Now, over on the calibration side, we had good solid practice and rules of thumb, but no formal defense for them. That means that there was almost no mathematical or theoretical underpinning for the 4 to 1 rule. We know it works very well, but we can't say exactly why. After World War II, there began a 45-year period in which a bunch of engineers stepped in and tried to weld these two worlds into something that was consistent, general, and useful, and could support growing industries. A lot of this work occurred in the U.S. defense industry during the Cold War. At many times during that period, it looked like things were never going to quite gel. But even when the development process seemed to be in crisis, people had snuck up on a crucial point of agreement. They had come to believe that there was no theoretical barrier to prevent us from being able to describe general rules that covered the uncertainty of all measurements. Today we know that any performance specification for a measuring device or a, uh, or a, a measurement itself, like a tolerance for a scale or a gauge, has to be considered within the framework of measurement uncertainty. This is because we know that measurement uncertainty is present in all attempts to measure anything. Now this is a critical concept, so let me say it another way. We know that all measurements are actually only estimates. The only way to say whether they are good estimates or not is to apply the practices and framework of measurement uncertainty analysis. If we ignore that, then the resulting specifications are very hollow and ungrounded in the real world. This is because they too are estimates. So if we act as if they're set in stone, then we're really just kidding ourselves. The performance specification that people are most familiar with is the calibration tolerance. So let's create a scenario for ourselves so that we have a place to put these concepts that we're developing and watch them come together inside a single framework. Suppose we make scales for a living. We make 1,000 scales every year. To monitor the quality of our production, we put the exact same test weight on each scale as it approaches the end of the production line. This graph shows the way that our entire year's production of 1,000 scales would respond were we to do that. As you can see, if we were perfectionists, we would scrap 999 scales and ship one very expensive scale. Or, if we were pirates, we'd ship them all and keep changing our address and business name. Instead, we select a doable tolerance. By doable, I mean narrow enough that it's challenging to our skills, but wide enough to allow us to make the money necessary to sustain the business while we learn to make better scales. A lot also depends on what our competitors are doing with their version of this exact same problem. This graphic is the heart of the questions that we're talking about today. We are free to set our acceptance limits anywhere we choose, but in and of themselves these limits are tolerant or tolerances have no direct effect on the process of making scales. Repeated attempts to measure the same quantity will result in a normal distribution. It doesn't even matter if we check the th same scale 1,000 times instead of 1,000 scales once at the end of the production line. Either way, we're going to get a normal dispersion pattern. Also, the core, the core message of measurement uncertainty is that every one of these points that, I, that, sca that um, scale so, so prettily on this uh, Excel spreadsheet are really only estimates of the thing we're trying to measure. You know, maybe from a marketing point of view, we should stop talking about measurement uncertainty and speak instead about measurement dispersion. There's a whole science to estimating the measurement uncertainty that accompanies every measurement that we make in our factory as we check our scale's performance. Any tolerance that we pick for our scales 
will have to coexist with the fact that every measurement we make of the scale, or even with the scale, is only an estimate of the most likely value. The dispersed group of these values that we get if we keep measuring the same thing is what's known as a distribution. Any tolerance that we apply to this distribution is just a pair of lines that divide the group according to our wishes or the needs of our business. These lines aren't arbitrary, that's not what I'm saying. I, they may be quite important to us. However, at the same time, the process that produces our data does not know where we've put our specifications or our tolerances or even what a tolerance is. It just keeps jumping along creating data and we have to keep measuring it while we try to improve it or at least keep it from getting worse. When I started out in this field, I clung to calibration tolerances like they were a life raft in a very rough sea. Now I see that there may be a lot of data behind them that gives us a lot of assurance that they really describe the way the instrument will work. Or maybe they're not so solid and um, there's not much data behind these tolerances at all. Now that is a question that can only be answered by uncertainty analysis, not by any tolerance. So that's what measurement uncertainty and tolerances have in common, and that's how they differ. I hope this has helped a little bit. For more information, please feel free to go to my website, and thank you very much for taking the time to check this out.